Okay, welcome to QOD video special Halloween version. So we're starting a new chapter. It's chapter five. It's on energy conversions, thermochemistry, uh, energy transformations in chemical reaction. And so just, just to quickly preface this, when we think about uh, what we actually use chemistry for in our society, uh, the primary thing that we actually use chemistry for in our society is to burn stuff to generate, uh, for the most part, electricity. And so we also use chemistry to make things like plastics and pharmaceuticals and parts for your cell phone. But the number one thing we use chemistry for um, in our society is to generate energy. And so we need to talk about energy uh, changes and energy transformations in chemical reactions. So most of you are coming to me from physics, um, and so some of this early stuff will be kind of review or will at least sound familiar to you, hopefully. Energy is the ability to do work or transfer heat. Uh, in physics, you probably would associate energy more closely with doing work. Uh, in chemistry, we're going to tend to talk about it more in terms of transferring heat. And so... Um, if we're using energy to cause an object that has mass to move, that is work. And if we're using energy to change the temperature of an object, then that is called heat. Mwahaha. Okay. Um, let's move on. There are two types of energy. Again, in physics, you would have learned about this. Kinetic energy is energy associated with motion. And we talked about the, um, when we were talking about gases, we talked about kinetic energy, that the formula for kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Um, here's a, here's a, just an illustration of the woman on the bicycle when she's sitting at the top of the hill. She has no kinetic energy, but she has potential energy because she's top of a hill. As she goes down the hill, her potential energy decreases as her kinetic energy increases. Potential energy, in physics, you would tend to associate it with, say, an object raised above the ground, and so it has potential energy because it can fall down to the ground. In chemistry, we tend to think in terms of chemical energy in terms of the, we tend to think of potential energy in terms of the energy that chemical bonds possess. And that's because chemical, uh, because atoms are made up of charged particles, positively charged protons, negatively charged neutrons and so this example is showing you that if i have a if i've got two like charges let's say both of these blue balls are positively charged if they have an infinite distance from each other then they've got zero potential energy but as i bring them closer together their potential energy begins to rise because as i try and push uh, two like charges together uh, they don't like that. And so that system actually has the potential to do work because if I got two like charges shoved together, they can do work by being pushed apart. Conversely, if I have two opposite charges, again, if they're infinitely separate from each other, that system has what we would consider to be zero potential energy. But as we move them and move them closer together, the potential of that system actually decreases and work is being done on that system as we move them together so that when once they're really close and they're attracted to each other that system really has no potential to do any work at all uh, because the two charges are already as close together as they can be these uh, like charges are governed by this formula which is the electrical potential of a system is proportional to so this is a proportionality constant called Coulomb constant. Q1 and Q2 are the magnitude of the charges on the two particles, and uh, D is the distance between them. Now, let me just go back. I don't know whether you learned Coulomb's law when you were in physics or not, but this is, Q, this is Coulomb's law, which is that force is equal to a constant, the Coulomb constant, times the, uh, times the charges on the two particles. Uh, divided by the square of the distance between them. So this is what's known as is Coulomb's law. Force is equal to the product of the charges, uh, is proportional to the product of the charges divided by the square of their distance. Now what I'm going to do is simply divide, uh, multiply both sides of this equation by distance. You'll recall from physics that force 
times distance is equal to work, which is a form of energy. So, uh, and in fact, a joule is a Newton meter. So force times distance is equal to energy. Um, and, I'm, and I am divide, also multiplying that side by distance. So this becomes, so force multiplied by distance becomes energy. When I multiply this side by distance, it simply cancels out one of the distance units in the bottom of the equation. And we get this equation that was on the previous slide. So this is derived from, from Coulomb's law. Blah. Okay. Um, let's think about this. Let's think about potential energy in terms of a chemical compound and the potential energy that is what uh, potential energy changes that occur when we form chemical bonds. Chemical bonds form because they are lower in energy, lower in potential energy than not forming the bond. Here's an example of a hydrogen molecule. Each hydrogen atom has a proton in its nucleus and an electron around it. So when we make an H2, there are two of them. And we have two repulsive forces here. The two nuclei are repelling each other and the two electrons are repelling each other. But we actually have four uh, attractive forces here between nucleus one and electron one, nucleus one and electron two, nucleus two and electron one, nucleus two and electron two. And so the, there are more attractive forces than repulsive forces here. And so it becomes uh, energetically favorable for a hydrogen molecule to form. Let me show this to you in a slightly different way. Here's the idea of if I take two hydrogen atoms and I separate them infinitely from each other, we would say that the potential energy of that system is, we'll just, we just define that as zero. As I bring those two hydrogen atoms closer together, those attractive forces begin to take hold. The potential energy of the system decreases until I reach the optimal radius, that is distance between the two nuclei, which is 74 picometers. If I try and go closer than that, what happens is, the repulsive forces between the two nuclei become too strong. And so you have an optimal distance when you're forming a bond at which you have this, the, uh, the potential energy of the system is at its uh, lowest possible point. Beyond that, the potential energy tends to go back up. So this is the length of a hydrogen, hydrogen bond. But the point of this again is to say that chemical bonds form because they are more stable than not, because it makes a more stable system than if they didn't exist. And, um, and so there are potential energy changes in the formation and breaking of chemical bonds. All right, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about energy units, and then we'll talk a little bit more about where this is all going. The SI unit of energy is the joule. You hopefully remember this from physics, that a joule is equal to one Newton, is a Newton times a meter. So because a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, a joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. And this is the unit that we're gonna use in all of our calculations and conversations. Another unit of energy that is uh, not used it used to be used in chemistry, particularly when I was younger, but really isn't anymore, is the calorie. Um, and the calorie is defined as the energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. That was its original definition. Now it is defined exactly in terms of the joule. And so one calorie is exactly equal to 4.184 joules. Here's another thing we want to define is what we're talking about when we talk about the system versus the surroundings. And so here we have a, and, and, and the reaction that's going to be described in the next several slides is the reaction of hydrogen with oxygen to give you water. So here I've got a piston, a cylinder with a movable piston that has hydrogen and oxygen atoms in it, if our molecules. If we're talking about that reaction, the reaction of H2 plus O2 to give H2O, anything that is part of that is the system. The H2, the O2 starting materials, and any H2O product, we would consider that the system. The, um, 
everything else, the piston, the cylinder, everything outside of that is called the surroundings. Okay. And so the cylinder, the piston, or even just the air and everything else around side uh, the system, that is, that is called the surroundings. We can, by the way, we can have three types of systems. We can have an open system in which both matter and heat can be transferred between the systems and the surroundings. That's not the case here because matter can't get out, but heat can. So that would be called uh, a closed system. So we can have an open system in which both matter and heat can be transferred between the system and the surroundings. We can have a closed system in which heat but not matter can be transferred between the systems and the surroundings. And this is an example of a closed system. We could also have an isolated system in which neither heat nor uh, matter can be transferred between the system and the surroundings. Okay, work, something that we're really not gonna talk a whole lot about in this chapter, but we do spend some time on it uh, early on. Work is the energy used to move an object over distance. And so it's force times distance, as I was talking about on an earlier slide. And so the, again, the, the, the unit is a joule because one Newton meter uh, is equal to one joule. Heat is energy used to change the temperature of, a, of, of energy that is transferred from one object to change the temperature of another object. Um, and so when we heat the pan, uh, using the flame, we cause the energy of the, the temperature of the water to rise uh, until it boils. Heat is going to flow from a warmer object to a colder one until they both uh, reach the same temperature. Now, let's talk about, so this is kind of a grab bag QOD video, I can't deny it. Um, and in the, in, in the assignment, online, I will try and give you a little bit more guidance about what sort of questions you can expect. But energy can be converted from one form to another. And so we've already talked about this. We've got the cyclist at the top of the hill who has no kinetic energy and all potential energy. As she begins to move downhill, her potential energy is converted into kinetic energy until the point that she reaches the bottom of the hill at which she has all kinetic energy and no potential energy. The first law of thermodynamics tells us that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be converted from one type to another. And here's an example of that. And so, as we said, as, as the cyclist goes down the hill, all of her potential energy is converted into kinetic energy so that when she gets to the bottom, she now has only kinetic energy and no potential energy. Now, let's think about that in terms of chemistry, because that's really what we're interested in. If we have a, and, and I talked earlier about the fact that when you bring a couple atoms, say, of hydrogen together, that creates a hydrogen molecule in which the energy of the system has now been lowered. And that's generally true. Anytime just atoms come together to form molecules, you are lowering the energy of the system. But it turns out that some molecules are higher in potential energy than others. So when you have a chemical reaction between molecule A and molecule B to give you molecule C, depending on whether A and B collectively have more potential energy than C or vice versa, the energy in a reaction could go down or it could go up. And so if the final state of the system after the reaction is over is lower in potential energy, than the beginning uh, state of the system, then we say that, um, that the system has lost energy and it's going to transfer that energy to the surroundings generally in, in the form of heat. If we have a reaction in which the system gains energy, that is the products have more potential energy than the reactants, that requires us to put heat in actually in, or energy in in order to cause that to work. And we would say that that is a reaction that's going uphill. A system that loses energy uh, over the a process in which the system loses energy is called exergonic. Ex means out, ergos means energy, energy out. 
a process in which the system gains energy, that is the surroundings supply energy to the system in, quarter, in order for that process to work. That is called end ergonic. Endo means in, ergos means energy, energy in. And your book defines the term delta E as the internal, E as being the internal energy of a system, which is the combination of potential and kinetic energy of the system. And so if delta E is negative, the system is decreasing in energy as the reaction proceeds. If delta E is positive, the system is increasing in internal energy as the reaction proceeds. This is the first law of thermodynamics. We can convert energy from one type to another, but we cannot, uh, we cannot create or destroy it. And so as I just got through saying, the internal energy is the sum of all the kinetic and potential energies of all the components of the system. Let's look at a specific example, and that is, as, as we saw in the cylinder, the conversion of H2 and O2 to water. Now, this isn't balanced. It takes two H2s plus one O2 to make two waters. But what this is saying here is that, that the internal energy of hydrogen and oxygen molecules is higher than the internal energy of water molecules. In other words, the bonds that form a hydrogen molecule or an oxygen molecule are higher in potential energy than the bonds that form a water molecule. And so if we convert hydrogen and oxygen into water, we are lowering the energy of the system. We always determine delta E by, divide, by subtracting the initial state from the final state. So in this case, delta E would be less than zero because the final state is, is lower than the initial state. This is a smaller number minus a larger number. That's going to give us a negative value. And so the production of water from hydrogen and oxygen is exergonic. It it releases energy because the energy of the system is being decreased. Wah! <laughs> Haven't been one of those for a while. Okay, so here is the uh, here's one more thing to talk about in terms of the system and the surroundings, and that is that if the if the if the internal energy of the system goes down, something has to happen to the energy. It can't just be destroyed. And what's going to happen to the energy is it's going to be transferred to the surroundings. So the change in energy of the system is going to be equal and opposite, equal in magnitude, but opposite in sign to the change in energy of the surroundings. And so if the energy of the system goes down, then the energy of the surroundings is going to increase by the same amount. If the energy of the system goes up, then the energy of the surroundings is going to decrease by the same amount. So in this reaction, whatever energy is lost by the system in going from hydrogen and oxygen down to water is going to be gained by the surroundings uh, in the form, in generally in the form of heat. So if, as I said before, if the final state of the system is higher in energy than the initial. That's called end ergonic energy in. If the final state of the system is lower than the initial, that's called ex ergonic energy out. Here's an example of just trying to think about chemical energy in terms of mechanical energy. Here is a reservoir in which the water up here is higher in potential energy than the water down here because it, it is has at a higher elevation. As that water flows downhill, it loses potential energy, and that is turned into the kinetic energy of turning a turbine and uh, generating power. So in losing potential energy, it is transferring that energy to, to the surroundings, and in so doing, generating electricity. 
when a chemical reaction occurs in which the potential energy of the uh, the final state is lower than the potential energy of the initial state, like water flowing downhill, that energy will be transferred to the surroundings and could be used to do work or just generate heat. Okay. One final thing. How do we change, what are the means by which the internal energy of a system can be changed? The means by which the internal energy of a system can be changed is that it either does work, releases heat, has work done on it, or gains heat. If the system gains heat or has work done on it, the signs of those two things are positive. Q means heat, W means work. If work is done on the system, then the sign of Q is positive. Sign of W is positive, I'm sorry. If heat is, is added to the system, the sign of Q is positive. And the energy and the sign of delta E is positive. If heat is lost by the system, then the sign of Q is negative. If work is done by the system on the surroundings, then the sign of W is negative. And if both of those things are negative, then the delta E of the system is also going to be negative. Because the change in internal energy is equal to Q plus W. All right, just a quick, um, a quick summary of those sign conventions. For heat, if Q is positive, that means the system gains heat. If Q is negative, that means the system loses heat. If W is positive, that means the surroundings do work on the system. If W is negative, that means the system does work on the surrounding. And if delta E is positive, that means that the internal, total internal energy of the system is increasing. And if delta E is negative, that means the total increase energy of the system is decreasing. Um, an example of an, what's called an endothermic reaction would be dissolving uh, ammonium nitrate in water. The temperature goes down because temp heat is required to make that occur. Potential energy of the, system, of the products is greater than the potential energy of the reactants. And so that is an endothermic reaction. And if, we, blah, and if we burn something, um, then the potential energy of the product is lower than the potential energy of the reactants. Heat is transferred from the system to the surroundings, and that is an exothermic reaction. Okay, this has gone on long enough. There's a big giant picture of Mr. Skeleton Man. Look for some guidance in the QOD assignment about uh, what types of problems might be on the QOD. I know this was a long video in which we covered a lot of different topics. This chapter will become more focused and more probably just a little more understandable as we move forward. Thanks for watching.